Hello and welcome to the shop. This is a view you're not used to. Why? Because I'm not standing in front of my Laguna. Instead, I'm standing in front of a Rockwell Delta that uh, hails from the 60s that was given to me by Jeanette Bean on the contingency that I make her a shoehorn using this lathe with a longer bed. So that's what we're going to do. If you look, you can see that we've got some nice views here. And you can see that we have a very nice, long lathe bed. That's going to make things a lot easier for large projects lengthwise. We're still working with a 12 inch swing. However, we want to do walking sticks and things like that. We've got four feet between centers, which is going to give us a lot more options when it comes to working. You'll also notice we're switching between multiple cameras. Things have been growing and changing here in the shop, and I'm glad to bring you in and have you be a part of it. First thing we need to do is find centers. And we're going to go by this, the instructions from the kit, which do not have us drilling using a uh, Jacob's Chuck, but has us rather drilling pilots at each end. So we're going to follow the kit, and if I do this project in the future, um, we might change that up a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and follow the instructions the first time. We locate our centers. We've got this nice steel bed here. We can uh, give it a little tap tap. And then we're supposed to drill a small pilot hole. This is also my first time working with Chakte Vega. I'm looking forward to turning this. Had someone in uh, my Worldwide Wood Turners uh, Club tell me last night that it cuts very, very nicely and it's very smooth to work with. So we're looking forward to that. Well, we'll go ahead and get this round. speed up a little bit. take a little parting tool, quarter inch parting tool here, and we're going to establish 5 eighths inch in diameter on each end. Just using a quarter inch spindle gouge or a quarter inch uh, parting tool in a peeling cut, just as though it were a quarter inch skew. In fact, it often pays in spindle orientation to consider your parting tool as a small skew. If you use it in that fashion, you find it's a much more effective and very versatile tool.
Let's go to each of these. I'm going to go motion in this old blade. I'm going to be procuring most likely a few sandbags to set down on the lower shelf. There's plenty of weight at the headstock where the motor and everything is. It's a big cabinet. However, there's no weight on the tailstock end at all. Well, I have a chunk of cherry burl in there right now to try and counteract the natural tendency for a little bounciness. We have sanded in both directions and one thing of note um, when you're sanding a spindle like if you're making pens or chopsticks or a cane it's always good to take your sandpaper whatever grit you're at and sand with the grain so you see the little circles from the sandpaper coming around the side if you stop and sand with the grain, you're not necessarily taking those scratches out of the wood as much as you're disguising them in the grain of the wood so that you no longer see those round concentric circles, those concentric scratches from sanding. We've got this up to 320 grit. We're going to finish this a little bit differently. We're going to use a, a very traditional method, something I feel uh, is something you should do on most spindle turnings. I try to remember to do it. And we are going to burnish. So we are going to get a good healthy handful of our shavings. Go ahead and kick up the speed. And that top section, uh, the handle section, is complete. Now this will get polished with carnauba wax. But there we have nice and smooth that top section. Very beautiful wood. Let's go ahead and continue turning. I also discovered that um, uh, the uh, so this this old lathe has five <clears throat> pulleys, different sizes, and it's kind of 
like the gears in a 10-speed bicycle. You have uh, wider pulley to, mid to progressing to narrower at the top, or no, narrower pulley progressing to wider at the top and wider progressing to narrower at the bottom. The outermost pulley, the narrow one on the top, was dented or warped. And so that was creating a lot of our shimmy and a lot of our shake. But if you look and hear, that's gone. It's a lot more steady, a lot stabler, more stable. I just moved the belt over one. Okay, so we're working on sanding and we have this one spot right here that keeps catching on the gouge and it's not going to sand, it's a little deep. So we have to turn that away. So we're going to be very timid here, very, very light. And we're just going to come down a few very light passes here and see if we can just get that little spot down we're very much riding the bevel here with our spindle roughing gouge this is a one and a quarter inch spindle roughing gouge from Packard Tools and it's a very good spindle roughing gouge. I'm quite pleased with it. Okay, we're back from our sanding and burnishing of the top section here. So we are essentially complete from here to here. Now, understanding with the grain of this wood that I am really working from this end this way, this is essentially my center point. It may be a little off measurement wise, but as in regards to the balance of this piece of wood, this is my center. So I'm gonna to continue to bring this end down to that center in order to counteract the strange there's, a, there's this twist and there's slight angle to the grain. It's not cut directly straight grain. And so that's why I think we're having the challenges we are with the grain picking and catching. It's not tool catches, it's actually the grain itself lifting up and catching. So hopefully that counteracts that grain. Face shield on, bring it back up to speed. I This does not have a speed meter it's not really a speedometer on the lathe i don't think i don't think that's what it is rpm indicator so i'm going to guess that we're roughly in the 2000 rpm range but uh we're also in the tool rest is too high range so we're gonna drop that down everything about this lathe is different than a modern laguna and I will tell you something interesting. I'm pretty sure that this banjo is from an older piece. 
And when I was cleaning up the steamless or the steel or the iron, actually, this is cast iron. When I was cleaning up the iron surfaces, I noticed that the bottom of this banjo is hand lapped. It is not machine lapped. Now the rails are machine lapped. The tail sock is machine lapped. The banjo, which appears, the, the fittings are different than the tail stock. It appears to be older, has hand lapping markings, meaning that a craftsman, a workman, with a stone is who smoothed the bottom of that piece by hand and that is really something interesting and very cool I need to do some research on years and models and see if I can find some pictures but uh, it's really a treat to have this classic laid in my shop in my hands be able to turn with it and be able to learn its quirks. It's really, really quite delightful. At this stage, we are going to gather a large handful of shavings of our Chocte Viga. It's kind of a golden, reddish, orange, brownish, beautiful, beautiful wood. We're going to kick up the lathe to about a thousand RPM, right in there. And we are going to burnish. We've got a lovely finish, nice slender tool, nice slender shaft for this. It's, I think, going to be quite a lovely little shoehorn. And I believe that the brass color is really going to complement the honey golds in the wood here. Now we need to take a quick pause and make sure that we are indeed going to be able to fit the cap over the end of this. So we will remove it from between centers quickly and that's going to cement in there nicely using two-part epoxy to fill the voids uh, we'll shoot epoxy in there just fine so we're going to go back between centers and we're going to part this end just a tiny bit proud of the uh, just a tiny bit proud of the top here so that we can drill and place the uh, business end of the shoehorn.
And there we have it. Parted it off, a little bit of cleaning, and we will be able to sink a hole here as well as epoxy the head here. So I'm gonna go ahead and move some things around and we'll get set up and we will glue the final pieces into place and talk about both the piece and what we learned again about that the new lathe. Was it the end of the world? I would, had hoped that it would um, not crack the end. However, I'm really not surprised because the grain of this wood has really uh, been challenging in every other way possible so of course why not have the end of it split when we put the uh, put the fitting in there that's just appropriate for the way that the uh, the piece is turned but that's okay we're going to make a nice little repair make it look pretty and again that will be hand sanded won't get to see that at this at the end of this video. We'll go ahead and make sure that we get that epoxy down in there. Really work it in. A lot of void. So that's uh, one thing I think you could take away from this kit, if T if PSI even still sells it. I don't even know if it's still available. Is that you've got quite about a bit of a void in the top there so if you can chase the threads that most likely would be the best solution and you can see that resin's coming out the top that's why we taped it up we will polish all of this all of this is going to go on the buffer but we're going to go ahead and tape well we're going to go ahead and get the glued gloves off we don't really have a way to clamp this so we're going to use the good old uh, painters tape clamp bring it up over the top we'll go ahead and wrap this and we'll bring it up this way we'll wrap it again now it's got a set for, uh, it's like I said, it's a 30 minute open time. I prefer to allow that to cure for about an hour. Oh, for about an hour. <coughs> I prefer to allow that to cure overnight. So the final, final finishing of this product will be buffing it and putting it together in its final form tomorrow. I won't be able to show you that in this video, but um, rest assured, all our little blemishes are gonna be addressed and again, if I decide that I'm not happy with the way my repair did, as far as the tip is concerned, I will readdress this. I will turn another one. I never want to send out something that looks bad, but I think this is going to actually be quite attractive with that gold resin in the top there to kind of uh, uh, accent the brass. Um, and I will easily be able to clean it. it. Like I said, it turns well, it sands well. This is a very, very useful resin. All right, um, I've been needing a longer bedway. I've got 48 inches here. I've got almost a full arm spread, and that's really, really, really beneficial. As much as I love my Laguna 1216, Without the extension, I've only got 16 inches. With the extension, I only gain another four inches of usable space in between centers. So I can't do something like turn a cane or a walking stick in one piece, where here I've got four full feet. Usual walking sticks are right at about 30 inches. I have plenty of room between centers to turn larger things. Stool legs, chair um, uprights, ballast, uh, balusters, all kinds of great things on this longer lathe. I can't tell Mark Soleil who organized the delivery and brought the lathe to me and Jeanette Bean how grateful I am for this wonderful tool. And it's definitely got a learning curve to it. We've got a few things. Uh, again, this is a uh, 60 year old machine. 
and it's running beautifully. But it's been updated with a variable frequency drive. In, in other words, I have a rheostat dial where I can speed it up and slow it down as well as reverse it. That wasn't originally available on this lathe, so it's been modified. And there are some things to learn with that for me. I wasn't there when it was modified. And um, Miss Bean was not necessarily able to describe to me some of the quirks of this tool. One of the things that I think um, is definitely going to be addressed is the design of the Laguna is essentially a pyramid and the weight is distributed, although the drive end is heavier than the tailstock end, it's not by much and the weight is fairly evenly distributed in a downward and outward direction. Here we have a very heavy column with the motor and the headstock and then a very light tailstock end. And so this lathe, it's light on the right end and I think I can address that. There's a shelf down below and if I put a couple of sandbags on the far end, I think that will counteract the tendency for it to, to kind of want to lean towards where the weight is. Um, uh, and it's exaggerating, but I feel like I could just put my hands here and lean back and just lift that tail stock up in the air. Um, that is an exaggeration, but um, I think it's easier, easily countered. We also have a fairly light cage steel cabinet with the iron bedway. It's not near as thick as the gauge of the stand of the Laguna. Um, again, this was made in the 1960s. So we're dealing with different times, different technologies. This most likely would have been bolted down into a floor, so that wouldn't really matter. Well, here I've actually had to build a stand for it to lift it up because it was almost five and a half inches below the center of my elbow. And as you know, you want your elbow to center up with the center of uh, the drive center and tailstock um, as far as how to, how to stand at the lathe. That's to save your back. Um, so I had to lift it up on a stand. I was originally just going to do rails. However, I wouldn't be able to step in close with my big clumpy feet if there was a rail coming from left to right. So I have a short rail from front to back here and a box on this end, adding to the weight on the headstock end. Other than that, this thing is absolutely delightful. Very easy to control. Um, once I figured out that there was a warp in the pulley wheel that I had the belt in and I moved it to the next wheel, it settled down a lot of that shaking. So at the beginning of this video, you saw a lot of shimmer and shake. We got that fit worked out. We figured that out. I'm learning the quirks of this tool. I'm learning the quirks of this design. I'm learning what they did 60 years ago as opposed to what they did five years ago, 10 years ago with the Laguna. And there are some differences. They're not huge, they're not glaring, but it's definitely different. And it's exciting to have my hands on an antique tool like this that I can really begin to explore and um, stretch my turning quite a bit. So thank you very much for joining me. I will do my best uh, to, in comments or somewhere, get photos of, the f of this finally sanded up, buffed, and put together. Um, and again, if my repair looks like it's not going to be successful, I will go ahead and uh, turn a new one. Um, I'm never going to send something out of the shop, especially in gratitude uh, for the gift of the lathe that is um, subpar. However, I kind of expected that we'd have that crack. This wood has fought me every step of the way, as I discussed during the turning. This was a challenging piece of wood in and of itself, I think, because the grain swirls, the density is something I'm not used to, although it's very similar to something like catalogs. Even though it's dense, it's softer. And I don't know if there's any better way to describe it. It's softer than something like catalogs is. <clears throat> I certainly could not get away with something I would get away with cutting-wise with cherry on this piece of Chocte Viga. So learning all around, learning a new tool, learning a new species of wood, learning to use the new cameras in order to videotape this presentation for you or film or data, whatever. So uh, a lot of fun today. I appreciate you joining me. 
apologize that it's been a while. Things are a little crazy because we're building and we're growing. And I hope to see you again very soon. Remember, just one more pass means put the bull gouge down.